Okay. And Watch that. tomorrow we will that announce the winner. Until so we shut we off, on the just hit that red game. button again. And with contact, just in case you don't show up, we don't have to win contact to get you your stuff. We'll just give it to the next person out. So, I'm just saying. Um, and then, rain pants competition. Somebody's already pre practicing. I'm just saying. Oh, um, good night. This is cute. That's a cute <laughs> So, all right. So with that, we're going to kick off session two uh, with nine and nine bands, and then my beautiful wife Stephanie will be speaking with you guys. Um, as soon as set two is done, you guys will have free time if you guys want to uh, work on your car or uh, just anything else you guys are welcome to. After dinner, we'll kick off at seven. Um, last call for CDs, pictures, signatures with Neely. Um, before they pack up and go. Okay. With that, I will turn it over to. I will turn it over to nine and nine. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. Are doing good? Amen. Well, Lord, we just thank you today, Father God. We thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for this time of fellowship, Lord. We thank you for this worship, Lord. We thank you for the rain, Lord. We thank you for what you're about to do, Father God. We just worship you, Father God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome into this place. And we thank you. Hallelujah. If I can just get everybody to stand. And let's just, just worship with us, amen. How many of you know that God is great, amen? He is great. Hallelujah.
He is reading upon us. Amen.
Yeah, give him a board.
you made a way for me.
going down the tree. That's a long place to fly. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to my beautiful wife, Stephanie. Well, she's going to be at the lesson, and then after class, we'll work to nine to nine. Serve you the rest of my life. And I don't know, 
I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's come to God like that. I, I would, you know, I'm not, there's billions of people that have been before. Someone has said that to God before, so I don't feel like that's a very unique situation. It may not be the most normal way to come to God, but that's who I am, so very honest with him from the beginning. Over the course of the years, um, you have emotions as a woman, and people tell you to shut up a lot as a woman. Get over it, walk it off, move on, build a truck, do something to get past these things. And so over that time, I stopped being really real with God because you weren't supposed to tell God, why would you let that happen? You're not supposed to tell God, you know, um, I don't really believe that you exist because there's so much ugly in the world right now. You can't tell God those things if you're a good Christian. And that's just what not any one person was saying to me, but where I was getting from traveling and seeing churches here, from churches I was going to, from people in everyday conversations and meetings like this, there was all this underlying tone of, if you're a good Christian, you walk straight, you move on, one step in front of the other, nothing to rail you. And then I would watch my friends that I started making friends after I was saved. They were slowly just like dropping like flies here, this guy over here, this girl over here. And I was like, how can they, God? They're not real Christians. They were never real Christians. If they could just fall off, because anyone who's really experienced God, how could they just... But it was like this little tiny thing that I was like, oh, I can handle that without God, because it's tiny, because I've handled this without God. And then, oh, this little tiny thing. Well, I've handled this without, with God, so I, I don't even need to bring this to God. And it was another thing, and another thing, and another thing, until this mountain stood before me that I had built completely around myself with situations I thought I could handle without going to God with him. And I don't know if you have ever felt yourself there or have ever found yourself there, because then all of a sudden, I couldn't see God anymore. I felt so lost. I just thought, you know what? Where is God? I can't even talk to you anymore. I can't come to you anymore about things. And in, up until this point, I had told, I've always told my girls, I have four daughters, I've always told them, Every morning you wake up, either create something beautiful or find something beautiful to look at. Because if you do that, all the ugly junk in the world, you will realize that God is still there in it. Because God creates the beauty. And so whether, you know, we've gotten pretty broad with our definition of create. I told them, if you want to create a beautiful memory today, that's good. If you want to create a piece of art, if you want to create a song, if you want to... You know, go look at the mountain if you want to go, you know, stare at your sister and say, oh, she's so beautiful, or whatever it is. Just do that, because then you'll see God. And through all of these little tiny situations building up on top of each other over the last year, I quit looking for beautiful things. I just thought everything is ugly, everyone is horrible, everyone's out and has their own agenda, and it's not the God or the church that I thought it was anymore. And... I, like, I hate to admit it, but after 16 years, I just stopped talking to God. And for the past 16 years, I have not spent one day, and I would probably guess while I'm sleeping, if it's the exception, not even one hour, including the time I was in labor with my children, without talking to God about something. I mean, I was in labor with my kids, and the, the nurses and doctors were like, you're doing so good, what's wrong with it? Because me and Jesus got this going on. And I know that he's got me, so I don't have to worry about it what's going on in my body right now. And I never spent time without talking to him. And then all of a sudden, all these situations build up, I said, I'm done. I told God, I'm done with you. I'm done with your church. I'm done. I don't want to be part of it anymore. It is an ugly, ugly thing. And I can't be in it anymore. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to a church or in your family or with your friends where you've just said, it's too much and I don't want to do it. So. My God, who loves me, and he knows that, that I was having a very skewed perspective on things, still kept talking to me. And I was like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Don't you, like, don't you see that my ears are covered right now, God? I really don't want to hear it. And he's like, but I still love you. I don't care. I don't want to hear it, but I still love you. But I still love you, and I still care about you. And I still need you to come to me. And so... Me, and I did, I've studied every book in the Bible. I actually have a Bible at home where every single page has something written on it. And I've studied word studies, and I have gone and 
read the entire chapter and notes on the sides and stuff, notebook pages in it, and it's highlighted. Every page, I'm not kidding, every page. And it doesn't matter where you open it up to, there's a note in there about something God showed me on that page. And I went from that to God saying, just start over. Start at the beginning. Just take a step back and remember that I am still God. That it doesn't matter. And so I took a step back and said, okay, God, I've always looked for your beauty. From the day that I finally gave you that five-year whatever ploy, that five-year contract, which turned into, obviously, it took about five minutes for me to realize the cut was real. It didn't even take the five years at all. And he, so I looked back and I was like, okay, I'm going to look up, what is beauty to God? What is the definition of beauty? So I looked up man's definition, which is a beautiful thing or a pleasing thing or person. Now, pleasing is usually like aesthetically pleasing. If you look at artwork, you can find the golden spiral. So if you have like a piece of paper here and you have art, you can divide it there, divide it there, divide it there, divide it there. And the prettiest thing should always be kind of on this third of the page on the bottom third of the picture. And that's, for some reason, our minds think that that's pretty. For whatever reason, they had, since probably the 1400s, they figured that out. That the human mind finds that pretty if you have something to focus to in that corner there. And so I said, okay, well, that's man's definition of beautiful. What is God's definition of beautiful? And he said, just start reading Psalms. Just start. It's a beginner book. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, I've studied Psalms. I've done that. I've highlighted it. I don't know. I've highlighted it. I've highlighted it again. Got a new Bible and highlighted it again. I've been there, done that. Don't want to do that. And God's like, Stephanie, I still love you. And you're not, I'm not giving up on you. He's, you know, I'm not doing it. So. He took me to Psalms, or Psalms 5, that we just read. So I wrote my notes on like three different notebooks, so just a minute. Okay, so back in Psalms 5, I want to kind of show you this a little, what God has been showing me for the last. And I'm telling you, this is really fresh for me. This Psalm study is very, very fresh for me. Um, usually I don't like to talk about things unless I kind of studied that, made it past that, and kind of on the next thing, where I can look back at that 2020 vision and sort of overall picture everything. And then I feel like I can take that and show other people what God showed me. But God really wants me to do this. So Psalm 5 says, Give ear my words, O Lord, and consider my sign. So as a woman, how many of you as a woman have ever been told you're emotional? Have ever been told it's at that time of the month, have a piece of chocolate, you know, whatever it is, right? And the thing is, it's like, it's not just one woman, it's all of us. So it has to be something. <laughs> it has to be something God created in us, right? Because if it's not just Dakota or not just me, and it's women everywhere, and I have been to a lot of places, and we're all crazy everywhere. All women are, and that's just the way God created us. That's just the way he put these emotions in our head, and it's a beautiful thing. If you could ever follow the train of thought of a woman from how she gets here talking about pancakes to how she gets here talking about how yellow is an ugly color or something and it all makes perfect sense if you were to just be in her head like and it's like like this fast because our heads are going and so god created us that way but this um this psalm was actually written by a man and he was dealing with some issues that were probably a lot more than some of us have dealt with people were trying to kill him people were trying to hurting, we were chasing him, think about it. This is from David. And it says, consider my sighing. And I thought, you know what? That's where I've lost it in the last year. I quit telling God. I just quit. Because I thought, I can handle this little thing. Oh, my kid is having an emotional day. I don't need God for this. I'll handle this. Or, you know what? Me and my husband are, haven't been communicating well. We've been there, done that. So I know what to do this time. I can handle that. And it just... It was like the paper that broke the camel's back. You know, ever heard that? You know, you have a camel and he can haul this, so the next time they add more, the next time they add more, until eventually the camel just falls over because it's too much weight. And you're thinking, this was only like a pound more than he carried yesterday, so why is he dead now? You know, what killed him? It's because overall, these little things add up. But it says, listen to my cry for help. God really does listen when we're crying out in our hearts. 
and little things, big things. I've never personally been chased by a band of people trying to shoot arrows at me, like David was. I've never been persecuted by a government that didn't agree with my religion. But little things, God still cares about these little things. And every single day, and like I said, every hour, going from talking to God to just shutting him out for, I don't know how many weeks I didn't talk to him. I just was done. And God said, I still hear you. I hear you screaming. You're just not screaming at me anymore. I just, I still hear your heart, though. I can, I know where you're coming from. And um, it says, in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. And in the morning, I lay my request before you. So he's talking about crying. He's talking about sighing. And in the morning, how many times do you wake up in the morning and you feel refreshed? Does that ever happen when you just feel refreshed? And then as the day goes on, you kind of have to realize, like, oh, it's a kind of a crummy day. I'm glad to be home. But then there's those mornings you wake up, and from the minute your eyes open, something's happening. You've got a leak on your roof, and you get up, and you're like, man, and you realize it leaked right into your printer. And you're like, chunk, I needed to print stuff for school. And then so you get out, and you go on your way, and you don't have gas in your truck. And then so you try to get gas, and then you're late for school, you're late for work, so you get an F on your final, you get fired from your job, and this is just like from the second you woke up, right? You know well, that's a bad day. And so when you are crying out to God in the morning, that's what David was doing. He was having such one of those days that in the morning he was crying out to God before anything even happened. I mean, I personally have a pretty peaceful morning until all of my kids are awake and then we're not getting the swing of things and they're not bad kids it's just a lot of work taking care of four kids they're all nine and under so they still require a lot of attention but those mornings when i'm woken up by someone screaming because i have a nightmare or because the dog pooped in the room or because a window got broken when they were throwing toys and they're trying to be quiet whatever it is it's i can i can still take these major things to God. First thing in the morning, he doesn't care. There's not a time limit with what God is telling us, with what God is willing to listen to. There's no, there's no time limit on any of that. He will listen to us in the morning. He will listen to us at night. So I just want to give you some other examples in Psalms. strong tower against my foe. Again, this is from David, and David was in a situation that probably most of us have never been in. But even in our very simple, seemingly minute situations that we feel like we can handle by ourselves, God still wants us to cry out to him. And he still is listening to us. And again, it's hearing my cry. And again, in Psalm 102, 1, it says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. And in Psalm 119.45, it says he cries out with his whole heart. And so God is not scared of our emotions. He created them. And if every woman that I have ever met feels like her emotions get out of hand sometimes, then it has to be something that God put in women for us to have emotions. And in men, so there's men that have emotions. But men tend to feel like they have to hide it a little more maybe or... Maybe they just really don't feel the same way. Like obviously, they don't feel the same way as women do. There's a, there's a difference between men and women in that area. And while I have seen men cry and men laugh and men get angry, it's different than women crying and laughing and getting angry. It's just a different kind of feeling, you know? But if God created that in us, then he is okay letting us bring that to him again. And if we can do that, then so many of our problems become so much easier to handle. Just like the 16 years where I just said, okay, God, everything. I was mad. God, I'm mad at so-and-so. And rather than running off to a friend and gossiping with someone about somebody else that I didn't like and they were driving me crazy and, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, can you believe what she did? And all that stuff that you want to do. And rather than doing that, I always took it to God. And so when people drove me crazy, 
Like, God, this person is driving me crazy. I really can't deal with them. And God said, oh, okay, well, then your schedules just won't match up for the next few weeks until you have a break. And then I was like, oh. It was just, and it wasn't that God is my personal bodyguard or anything, but it just was God knew at some point I needed a break from certain things. And by taking those requests and those cries to God, he was able to provide these things for me. Instead of, over the last year, one of the things I did was I started going back to school again while I homeschool my kids. And I thought, oh, I can do this. You know, no big deal. And I, I really still feel like that's something I need to be doing, but maybe at a much slower pace than I was doing at the time. But I never really told God, you know what, I'm really stressed out and I will to do today. I just said, okay, I sat down and I made a list and I made a list and I made a plan. And I said, I can do this. And from the second I woke up at like four in the morning till I went to sleep like at midnight or something, and I would do this for like three days in a row before I would just be all done. Someone else has thought of being an adult today because I can't do it. And so it was starting to wear on my physical body as much as my spiritual body and not being able to spend time with God. Um, so like I said, in all of this journey, when I was watching my friends walk away from God, never understood it. Thought, you are ridiculous and you never knew who God was if you could walk away from him. To where I am now, realizing that Sometimes it's a huge event that turns us away from God, something in the news or something personally that is just very traumatic that says God doesn't exist. That for other people, it's just these small, I can't handle this, I'll handle it, I'll handle it, and eventually if we're handling everything, what is God doing for us? We're not allowing him to do anything for us. And... Um, so with... This, like I said, this beginner book of Psalms, I've been studying the psalm every day, just picking one psalm every day, and I know when I get to 119, it's probably going to take a few days. It's a pretty big book there, or a pretty big chapter in that book. But I just encourage you, if you feel it all, like you have emotions in here that maybe your parents don't understand, that your friends don't understand, that your pastor doesn't understand, that God understands that, because he sees not only because... If I go to my husband and tell him I'm really mad because A, B, and C happened in my day, and I'm mad about that, and he's like, well, those are really tiny things. Like, why are you so mad? But if I go to God and said, God, A, B, and C happened, and I'm mad, he understands that yesterday this happened, and the day before that this other thing happened, and it's all just accumulating, and he can deal with that instead of just trying to blow him off all the time. But we really should be encouraged that maybe we shouldn't blow our emotions out just because we have not God created him, that it's not some sort of blanket excuse to just vomit our nasty thoughts on the people around us, but that we can take that to God. And to be really honest with you, I have used some very ugly words with God, and I've had to tell him I'm sorry, but at the time, God didn't just black out the sky above me and say, nope, you used a nasty word with me. Not until you apologize, I won't help you. He doesn't do that. He says, oh, you're hurting. You're hurting so bad that this really ugly thing came out of your mouth. And I see that this ugly thing came from somewhere. And I'm willing to help you fix what's over here while I'm overlooking it until I can get you to a place to apologize and ask for forgiveness and move forward. Whereas if I were to use an ugly word with my husband, he'd probably walk out the door for a few hours. <laughs> or go outside and pull weeds or do something else because he doesn't like when I talk to him mean, which I don't know if I like, would like when he talks to me mean. But as human, we interfere with each other sometimes that way. But just be honest with God. And so I want to give you guys a challenge, an encouragement to maybe not be afraid to go back to a beginner book that you feel like is maybe child's play, like the story of Jonah. Oh, that was a children's church story. David and Goliath, that was a children's church story. But don't be afraid to go back to them and see what God can teach you now. And don't be afraid to open up your heart and just spill your guts out to God. Because he already knows what's in there. Like, it's nothing new. You can't say anything that's going to make God go, ah! I can't believe that was in you. <laughs> because... He knows it's there, and chances are you're not the first person on earth that's had it in there. 
Just like I said when I gave my life to God and said, five years, God, if you can fix me in five years, I'm all yours. Otherwise, I'm back to what I was doing before. I'm not the first person that told that to God. While God did convict me later and say, it's all or nothing, there's no conditions with me. And I had to say, okay, um, I had to make a choice before that five-year mark of whether I was in or not. God did lead me down that path. I know I'm not the first person that came to God and said, you know, I'll give you this much time because God can work in whatever we're giving him. And so I gave him five years. Like I said, it took about five minutes before I was home that night. I realized that, that God was real. And before the end of the week, I said, okay, God, I'm all yours and from here on out. It didn't even take, like I said, maybe a week for me to get to that point to say, I'm all yours. And God works in that parameter. And so when you have emotion, just let it out. And don't always take your emotion to your friends because sometimes they just feed the beast without helping calm it down. Okay, and I have to watch myself even with the people very, very close to me. I have to be very careful sometimes about what I let out because sometimes some of them will just be like, and then what happened? And then what did you do? And then what happened? Oh, but then, oh my gosh, I would have said this and I would have done that and I'm just, I'm about to Jerry Springer somebody in about two minutes after I talk to some people. Like, I am done. And I'm, before I was a little ticked, and now I'm like, someone call the cable company and record this because I'm getting, you know, because I want to be, I'm so upset about it. But, so here's my last final thing. Read something in the Bible every day from the Bible. And I know that there's a lot of really, really amazing books and authors out there. But if they are not pulling information from the Bible, then you need to be careful about using them as your source there. But as long as, I mean, you know, read a devotion book. You know, you have the Bible app online, you have the devotion. As long as it's always tied to a scripture, then that's cool. As long as you're reading it every day. And I've been on some of those devotions, and they go off on something really weird, and then they have this one half of a scripture that sort of maybe kind of doesn't maybe sort of does support what they said. And I'm like, yep, done with that plan. <laughs> I'll move on to the next one because that one obviously is not from God. My second thing is just to open up, spill your hearts out to God and be real. Don't be scared of your emotions. Don't be scared of anything. And at the same time, that doesn't give us the right to be hateful and evil to the people around us. But it does give us the opportunity to let that out in a safe place with God. So I am going to pray with you guys and um, We'll gather back up the nine of nine band, and then we'll do some more worship today. God, I want to again thank you for giving us a place where we can come before you, where we can be honest with you in a setting that is peaceful and beautiful and serene. And it is hard not to see your creation and your glory while standing on this mountain, God. And it's really easy to remember that you exist up here. But when we get back down in our work and our lives and in all of the situations that we think we have, and that we got this God, then we remember that you are there to back us up in every choice. What am I making for dinner? Maybe I should ask God what, what would go good for dinner. What am I, but Lord, that we would remember to always come to you with our decisions. We would always come to you with our heart, with our emotions, with everything inside of us, because either you put it there, or you're willing to help us get it out of there. And you know the difference. And you know what we need more than anyone else close to us, more than our best friend, more than our spouse, more than our parents, more than our teachers. Lord, you understand where we've been and where we're going more importantly. And you know what we're going to have to get rid of to get to the place you've called us to be in. And what we're going to have to keep to get to that place you've called us to be in. So Lord, I pray again that our hearts will be open to you in every situation, in every thought, in every place, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Maybe I'll come back up. Okay. Yeah, and that's why you had extra socks. Okay. Why did they leave? I don't know how to get back to the stuff. Do I just click it? Uh, I think so. Alrighty, um, if any of you in here tonight heard this afternoon in prayer, um, or anything, I'll invite Stephanie back up, and uh, she'll, she'll be here to pray for you guys, and we'll let Kelly just play something soft and go. Um, worship starts. Oh 